Your favorite band's about to play a sold-out show. You got in... Over here! ...with a friend and found a spot close enough to see the set list. They're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Today on the show, comedian and actor Rick Overton talks about living in New York and his neighbors. I was John Lennon's neighbor back in the 70s. He was over on 72nd, and I was on 74th, and I would see him all the time. He'd go, how are you? Very good. How are you? I think, you know, or whatever. And we would just walk our way. It's interesting to see a hero who you keep in a kind of god file in your brain, just walking around and shopping, watching your god go shopping. <laughs> it's a weird experience, you know? It's always a good time when Rick Overton's around. Today on the show, Rick talks about his neighbor, John Lennon. Stay close. Hey, it's Rick Overton, and you're listening to Story Worthy with Christine Blackburn. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. I'm so glad you guys tuned in today. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, for that matter. It's just jing, jing, jingling around the corner, isn't it? (laughs) Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the story last week from comedian John Flynn and his story about New York and about Broadway and about his friends there. And I found that episode absolutely fascinating. Rick, you would get into this guy, John Flynn, because he spent most of his life in New York. He worked in this record store where they had really obscure copies of crazy records. And anyway, go back and listen to John Flynn, his story last week here in Storyworthy. But not today. You got to stick with me because like I said, I'm here with the one and only Rick Overton. Man, Rick, you make me laugh. You walk in my door and you make me laugh. Yeah, well, that's the way I like to start. I'm telling you. <laughs> Thanks. You are good so crowd. funny. And Rick brings forth the topic, I kept running into John Lennon. That's true. At one point in my life, there was a period of time. That is such a specific topic that you just kept running into John Lennon. But I guess at the end of the day, if you both lived in New York and you were neighbors, I'm assuming. Yeah, okay. we were neighbors. Well, I can't wait to hear about this because... um. I mean, I don't know. To me, John Lennon is just, of course, iconic, and I grew up with his music. I've been married twice, both to John Lennon songs. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, there's mm-hmm. that. They he's, were... he's, done, he's made the wedding circuit <laughs> with his music, you bet. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. So, you know, it's just like he's, you know, and we were talking about how he was born in 1940, died in 1980. Mm was 40 years old, only 40 years old when Just he died. 40 years old. And, you know, I was in high 63 school. 63 now. You know. Yeah, yeah, I was in high school at the time, mm. and I was uh, about 15, and I remember thinking, you know, I couldn't believe it that he was shot, first of all. Like, there was like a shock wave that went through the high school, like through the hallways. It was, it was so shocking. Even, yeah. you know, at our high school in suburban Pennsylvania, or rural Pennsylvania, and I remember it being so shocking. But then I also thought to myself, well, he was old because I was only 15. I thought mm, 40 right. was older. Like Perspective I is everything, right? Right. And now I think 40 years old, he was just a baby. It's depending on which way you're looking at it, right? Catching a moment in time like it's frozen in amber. And then you, which is the stationary object, which is the moving one? You know, and you watch someone... From your past that you thought was one role to become an entirely different thing, just like you watch the doorknobs get lower and lower in your old house as you get bigger and bigger, <laughs> yeah. and all the rooms get smaller. It's so true. I was recently at my mom's house over Thanksgiving, and I can't believe eight people lived there. Right. You know, it's just it's crazy. We must have been tiny. How did we all fit in there? <laughs> well, you were smaller, you know. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I'm anxious to hear, you know, uh, your take on John Lennon, because he did he did seem like a pretty normal guy. He seemed like, obviously, a fair guy. Obviously, an artist and interesting, and to just have him as a neighbor must be, you know, just really 
I guess, normal. Now, you have been on StoryWorthy many times, Mm -hmm. talking about orgies. Well, sure. (laughs) Uh, You've talked about drugs. Well, sure. We've talked about uh, some of your some of your acting gigs, but there's so many. You, honestly, I was looking on IMDb. Do you know how many credits show up for you on IMDb, Rick? Uh, I'm very fortunate to have been given lots of chances to finally get it, you know, down on the page. There. Numbers finally, because it takes a few times. You practice and you want to learn as you go. But how many? I had a lot of chances to earn while I learned. You're very fortunate, very but you're grateful for that. Yeah, but you're also very talented, obviously, and that is why. How many credits show up? Come on, give me a number. I don't do have think? a number. I just know there's a there's a bunch now. One hundred and seventy three. Was it up to that? Okay. Right. <laughs> One hundred and seventy three yeah. acting okay. credits. That's so impressive. Great. Okay, you guys, listen, before we get to Rick's story, I wanted to remind you to head over to the website, storyworthypodcast.com, and join the mailing list. I'm just going to leave it at that. That's it. And don't forget to subscribe to Storyworthy on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or, you know, TuneIn or iHeartRadio, wherever you guys are listening to your shows now. Okay, you guys, let me just lay it out for you. As I said, Rick Overton is an actor. We know this, right? You also, of course, know he's a comedian, right? He's a writer, and he's a damn good harmonica player. Oh, thanks. And check me out on Showtime's I'm Dying Up Here. I, which I got it right here. Two is I got up. it right here. I'm Dying Up Here is so exciting and so interesting. Season two is coming up. If you guys haven't seen it, it's super, um, it's just a fascinating look at what it was like to struggle and try to make it big in the 1970s comedy scene. Exactly. And they have like a woman playing the role of what would, I guess, be like Melissa Mitzi Melissa Leo Shore. is brilliant. Right. It was, she acknowledges as Goldie, Goldie acknowledges in her universe a Mitzi Shore. Right. She says, oh, I heard you killed over at the comedy store. So who's, who are you loyal to? Which means she's in that universe as a competitor. It is so fascinating, and it's like a grainy look to the film. It looks like it's set in the 70s. Of course, the costumes are all the 70s. Every character is believable. It's fascinating. It's on Showtime, you guys. Uh, you can get a free... If you don't get Showtime, you can go over to YouTube and get a free uh, copy of it. That's how I saw my first version. And just watch com- comedians you've known and loved for a long time knock it out of the park as actors. They're all terrific, terrific Fantastic. actors. Aren't they? Amazing. Judy Kathy, Gold, Kathy yeah. Ladman. Kathy yeah. Ladman. It's beautiful. Come on. It's really, really great. Uh, but let me just run down some of your credits for everybody out there, just because, come on, Rick, the, you are phenomenal. You guys, Rick has starred in numerous HBO and Showtime specials, and he's had countless television stand-up appearances. Now, as for acting, I mean, come on, I just have to say, you played the Drake on Seinfeld. I mean, that's huge for a lot of people. That right there solidified your whole existence in Hollywood. That's oh, I don't know how sign- far. That, well, I, I think it helped with sitcoms. It helped with t- TVQ for uh, recognition in um, the half hour world. Just beautiful. Doing a Seinfeld, yeah. doing two Seinfelds couldn't hurt. That's right. And then, of course, you were Pam's dad on The Office. Yeah. And you've been a reoccurring character on Children's Hospital, which is hilarious. Uh, ABC's Last Man Standing. I love Rob Cautry. Oh, so do I. TNT's Leverage. You've also guest starred on The League, The Middle, The Kroll Show. Nick Kroll, he's a genius. Uh, he's a genius. He's News like readers. a Peter Sellers level Absolutely. genius. Absolutely. And then you were on some of the classic TV series like Lost, ER, Mad About You, Married with Children. Yeah. And then on the big screen, so you do all the television, then on the big screen you turn around and you've worked with people like Ron Howard and Harold Ramis, Steven Soderbergh. Yeah. And, oh, and, and it was really fun. Did you see all the comedians working in uh, that movie that I worked with Steven Soderbergh? It was called The Informant. Yeah. Uh, Damon plays this guy who's lying to everyone and conning everyone from A to Z. It's, I think it's some of Matt Damon's finest work no i don't know this the informant it's called the informant and i play his boss okay and, oh good uh, you, uh, you might not recognize me. i'm much heavier but it's oh uh, i want to see I'm that the uh, head of archer daniels midland uh, the people who make corn syrup you know uh-huh, uh-huh. and uh about all the crooked fixing of Prices on corn internationally. Oh, I'm going to look for this. The informant. That's a good one. It's oh, good. A comedy with all comedians doing unbelievably fantastic straight roles, and the circumstance is what's so funny. Yeah. Uh, you're going to see all these. Uh, uh, Tom Papa is fantastic. He's a great. He's a great comedian. Now, do you think one of the reasons why comedians are so brilliant at 
at at at dramatic roles like your friend Robin Williams was, is it part? I don't know. Is it partly because comedy is so hard, the drama ends up being easier? Maybe. I think you got to get your head around the fact that there's a connection, and if you do, you stop fighting what should be a natural conclusion. Why would you fight something that seems like, of course, it's connected? Hmm. Of course, the the ability to present oneself and take a risk and either be judged for the fact that I could make you hold your attention and just look at me and think I'm interesting, or I elicit a laugh or a tear. You know, they're connected. I'm trying to make you get. I'm trying to make you emote and look at me. That's your connection right there. And then everything else branches. That's Rome and every lo- road leads out from there. And maybe it's also because comedians have the timing and the confidence to wait. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, nothing like lifetime, <clears throat> a lifetime of lifetime feedback, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So that you have... Immediate feedback immediate as well. Immediate feedback as opposed to waiting for a release date to see if anybody likes it, which is months or years. So you've worked in films with roles in um, in movies like Bad Teacher, The Informant, of course, like we just said, Dinner for Schmucks, Cloverfield, Groundhog Day, Mrs. Doubtfire, Willow. And then on top of all that, you have an Emmy for writing on HBO's Dennis Miller Live. Where has Dennis Miller been? Do you know? Um, I, I know he has radio. He's He's got a radio show. Yeah. And uh, he makes appearances on uh, different shows you know is he a trump supporter i don't know now you see isn't that interesting because of course he was such a voice for the republican party for so long and then i wonder I, I, that's I don't a good know. question i, I, ha- really I haven't about. checked so okay uh, it's an interesting more question importantly, I don't know more importantly that. you were just showed up a couple weeks ago on one of our favorite shows speechless <laughs> which i adored your work in that thanks a lot uh, i just <laughs> love they... you as a teacher oh, you're so good as a teacher he's a director in this one yeah. yeah and then in veep of course you played a congressman and how great must have th- that must have been amazing yeah uh, to be a, an idiot congressman was a treat <laughs> he guy was an idiot <laughs> Just to be on that set, though, right? Oh, what a fun time a to get pleasure. to work when, you know, and it's been a little while since I was the Drake. I just, it's just they such see a Julia pleasure. again. Yeah. So run into That's that familiar right. face How again. That's interesting. Yeah. So really, what was that, like 20 years later, you work with Only her again? Only 20 years later. There we are. And she yeah. is the star. She is the, she She's, is V. She is timeless. She's so stunning. Lucy level. Yeah. Timeless. Forever. Uh, to be archived comic genius that goes goes into the the records as yeah. one of the ones you know. You know, I watched her series, um, the New Adventures of Old Christine. We watched that like you know every one probably five times over. That Does... that, that show was he- hugely <laughs> funny, and that barely got any attention. I mean, she's done so much work. I mean, beyond Seinfeld and then Veep, and she's just she's just always working. She's stunning. And now her health, I know, well, we don't have to go into that, but but yeah, she sounds like yeah, she's getting yeah. all the sounds care like she needs, or what she needs. I just got my fingers crossed. And, I know. You know. We can't uh, afford to lose a comic force like that. Yeah, you know? so yeah. So let's not picture that. Okay, now you also have something coming out in 2018 called Electives, and you play a teacher in that, right? That's a series. Yeah. And that looks very funny as well. But, you know, these things go on the market, and there's so many new networks now that you thought, well, the big three didn't touch it. I'm finished in the water. And then you look on your email, and someone that you mass emailed to on one of these other networks might pick it up. It's great. So, you know, you shoot something, and then you wait. You wait, That's and right. you hope, and you do, and you wait. And that is at every level of everyone's career. Do you think that is that true? I think now it's truer than ever because of the expanded media market where what you would call a network show is not something you would get your old zenith warmed up for unless your computer is linked up to your zenith. Did you, when you were a kid and you turned the TV off, did it go, poo? Flatline dot. Right. And gone. And gone. And did they always And then play? eventually not. And eventually ghost mid-bar of news channel we don't get. For a moment, in in ghost fuzz, yeah. shrinking. But before that was the um, 
the the <laughs> it was the they played the anthem, the national anthem with a flag. And the Air Force poem, I reached the surly bounds of heaven and uh, jet fighter flying through the thing. That's sort of true, a military, right? It was an ad for the military, it was an Air Force ad. And that's absolutely true. Yeah. That's how it's in that national te- or, or, or uh, p- television, that's how they signed off. And the a network tone television. of snow after that. In the 70s. And then all of, do you remember when they all of a sudden started having television 24 hours a day, when it got expanded like that? It was like, where are they going to find content? <laughs> <laughs> find more out about Rick over at realrickoverton.com. And of course, follow him on Twitter. You're really good on Twitter. Follow him there, you guys, at Rick Overton. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Rick Overton. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, no, seriously. Stay digitally seated. Uh, I was John Lennon's neighbor back in the 70s and would run into him. But I was running into him, weirdly, before I was his neighbor. Before I was his neighbor, I, I, uh, I saw him when... I had just done the Bill Boggs show in the morning with Roger Sullivan, Overton and Sullivan. We were a comedy team, and we got a shot on TV doing the Bill Boggs show. And it was Stiller and Mira. And they liked teams. They liked comedy teams, Stiller and Mira. And so they liked Overton and Sullivan. So Roger and I got a chance to go do a TV show. We were the two screw-up waiters ruining Thanksgiving dinner on a live broadcast, having the time of our lives. We loved it. And uh, top of the world, where you know, we bet we'll hear nice things from our friends who we all beg to watch, you know. And uh, walking around, and I high fived Roger Sullivan. He went off to do the thing he had to do that day, and I was just kind of duped to doing through the park. And boom, I run into John Lennon and Yoko walking through the park. It's got to be like 1976 or something like that, or five, maybe 76. And there they are. And oh my God. Uh, yeah, and I, I just walked up and said, I, I, I'm tongue tied and I didn't know exactly how to put it. And I said, I, Listen, you, you don't understand. I, I already had, like, I thought I had the day. I thought this was the day. And then turns out you are like the most perfect top to the day I thought was the perfect day. You're the perfect top to that part that's more even perfect than that. Went, oh, well, thank you very much. And I did, just a big goof, like a big Marmaduke, stupid, fl- <laughs> floppy, goofy dog, just kaduk kaduk and just romping through the park, just happy with the whole thing. And uh, then I thought, well, you know, that's my one story. You're not going to run into the, him ever again. You don't get multiples on a thing like that right. unless you move a couple of blocks away. And so I, I lived briefly on the... Uh, West Side, Upper Midwest Side. And uh, he was over on 72nd. I was on 74th. At the, I was staying at the Berkeley, just two blocks away from where he was. And I would see him all the time with Yoko. But it was a transformational time because it was also a time when there was a strange, an element of social resentment against him for breaking up the Beatles for his girlfriend. And so it wasn't always a welcoming glance at him when he walked by. It would be a couple turning and whispering and the guy nodding and like, <laughs> what a kind of a know-it-all, yeah, told you the kind of thing about it, you know. And so certainly when you were used to people screaming, it's not the faces you want as you're walking around. So anyone that would give a wow face, he would kind of go, hey, how are you? And give us a friendly nod back to you. So I had a wow face. So he'd always shoot a, hey, well, how are you? He started to recognize me. We started to have visual cues with a, with a you know, kind of guys with a head kickback. What's up? You know, the what's up head? As opposed to, huh? Or mm, head retract and shoots backwards from you like you smell bad, you know? No, it was a, uh, 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 yeah, bounce. I was starting to get the head to retract and kick back a lot. It wasn't, hey, Rick, how are you? No, that's the fantasy version. But it would start to be chatting a little bit briefly. How are you? Very good. How are you? Perfect. You know, or whatever. And we would just walk our way. Uh, it's interesting to see a hero who you keep in a kind of God file in your brain. Just walking around and shopping. Watching your God go shopping is a weird experience, you know. Being normal. The normalization of an idol through uh-huh. repetition of seeing them do everything you do, it can go in two directions. It can either 
make you feel like uh, you're not worthy to continue doing those things either. Or you can see that maybe there's something in you that could influence people in a positive way in the world too. And uh, that you can be extraordinary because even extraordinary people have to go to the store and get stuff. There he is. He's just shopping. Shopping with Yoko. You can't really miss the way he'd dress, you know. Because it was like a very English style, like the modern... Well, it'd either be a denim thing or a... But it would be a striking look. There'd be something cool and striking about it. Yeah, I remember he had that... um, Even when dressed down. That denim patchwork jeans that he would wear. And then that like jaunty jaunty cap... Yeah. That was kind of like on the side. Yeah. So where were you when he when you heard he got shot? I was at the improv. In New York? Yeah. But he was shot in the morning, wasn't he? It was early morning? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And did you guys maybe gather at the improv? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Because back then, obviously, no social media. So we're listening, we're all listening to AM radio, or did you kind of hear it through the streets? I just finally heard it when people told me. Yeah. I wasn't following. Yeah. And then I got clobbered with it. And, and then did you see Yoko Ono after that in the streets still? Did you still see her Not around? Not as much. Yeah. Not as much. They lived in the, D- the Dakota, I think it was called. Yeah, in their building. Yeah, the Dakota. I can kind of picture the windows uh, because, of, right. you know, in some of the. Did you ever see the Imagine movie? It's called Imagine. It was very beautiful. It was a documentary, you know, uh, by John Lennon. It was his voice, but it came out, I think, in maybe 90 or 91. I'm going to look it up. Maybe even 89. It's called oh. Imagine. Oh, you would love it. It's oh, all it. it's all documented by John Lennon. It's very oh. beautiful. And they show their apartment and they show, oh. you know, um, of course their you know, the places in London. It's very comprehensive. And because it's John Lennon's voice through the whole thing, it's it's really nice. And then they also show um Sean Lennon and and uh, Julian Lennon and Yoko Ono, and they all talk. So it's really pretty good, yeah. And then when did, what year did you leave New York? Um, I started dodging visits back and forth to the West Coast, to L.A., to start putting my name out there and letting people get to know me in case I think I'm going to move, uh, maybe get a little something set up for me, you know, set a little... Someone saw my set, you know? Sure, sure. So they can we come back and go, oh, this guy's funny. Can someone put a word in for me? Yeah, yeah. So I did a little of that, and then I moved out in 80, late 80. In, in late 80, that's yeah. right, because you were the kind of the first wave of comedians that came out. And boom. F- for sure. For the do you ever? Boom. Do you ever wish you, yeah, it was the first wave of the comedy boom, for right. sure. Did you, do you ever wish you were back there, or do you ever wish, or have you gone back for any length of time, you know, for a show or? To do stand-up? Yeah. To I do, do stand-up. In New York, uh, wherever you know, whatever city has a chance for me to do stand up, mm-hmm. and I can do it. I'll do it. I have been to New York a bunch. But do you ever think you know you wish you'd lived there again, or had formed your community and your life there, or are you just glad to be in Southern California? Well, there's now there's a lot of production there. There's an allure to both. Uh, but there's more production now in New York, mm-hmm. but not back then. Interesting. There wasn't as much production then. But the weather and all that, do you take that into account? I don't I don't complain about that. I realize if even it was as cold, weird as it's getting now, you know. If it was cold, would you complain if it was cold? Here? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, certainly if I'm driving down a steep hill and it's icy, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to complain. <laughs> so you've been in L.A. for, you know, 30 years now. Is there anybody out here that you're still starstruck by? John Cleese, and uh, I used to bumble. I can't get my sentences together around him. John Cleese? Yeah. I met him in uh, 93, and uh, I I ran into him through a revolving door at the Fear Yard Sighting Hotel in Munich. How do you say that? The Fear Yard What? The Fear Yard Sighting. Wow. Four season. Ja, oh. year, mm. Zeit, like time, Zeiten, ja, Zeiten, season, ja, Zeiten, time of year, vier, four, 
I love it. I love it. I would have just said the Four Seasons. That's but you it, say it's it so when much you're there better. In Munich, it's the Fiat Yachtzeiten. See, that's how Hannes Finney would say it. All right, Hannes, right. Because he knows his he knows German well that. as well. He knows well. better, way better than me. That's I awesome. Ran, I ran into John Cleese, and I, I just said, Mr. Call, Mr. Cleese, you don't even, because... The, first, first of all, I'm 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 a person. I the, for years it's been, <laughs> and now now this is so different. That I can't even in one even sentence. It's in, <laughs> just, just, just shorting out everything. Slam, all the train cars are jamming together. You know, meeting the guy. He that, would like you so much. Oh, we met. We had a good time. So he was very generous, and very kind. That's but that's wonderful. The, that's the human mechanism I'm describing. Is the thing that I the idolizer. Yeah. The inner idolizer that would take your regular level of composure and toss it because somewhere in your subconscious, you have a, a thing that deifies this individual that you, 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 you kind of supplicate yourself to while you don't realize you are in trying to finish a sentence, boldly say something while slamming on the brakes at the same time. The one person you don't want to say the wrong thing to, you know? Well, it's just so interesting because there are, you know, like, and I, I've met a lot of interesting people and a lot of famous people, as it were, a lot of celebrities, as it were, and nobody really phases me. But there are people that if I saw Neil Young in the grocery mm -hmm. store, I would take a huge step back and then probably faint. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I could get my head around that. I really don't. Okay, uh, Raphael. I see Stephen Stills every now and then around town. I, uh, Stephen wouldn't do it for me. He's very talented and everything, but yeah, I could... He's part I, of my uh, youth. Yeah, no, me too. Um, me too. But but for me, uh, also Raphael Nadal. That would, be, right. that would be a scene stopper for me. A half year to hang out and do... Uh, has that occurred? No, no. But well, he's my boyfriend. Running, so. He is my boyfriend. He doesn't know it. But now he does. Well, yeah, and I hashtag him a lot. You know, I, I tweet him a lot, so he knows it maybe a little bit. But I think he might know in a stalking fashion. Uh, but but there are certain people. So who else? So John Cleese. Uh, I think if I were to meet Paul McCartney, I'd probably bumble it up a bunch. Yeah, I would love to meet him. He would. And John Bugle sings old throw an arm around his buddy. Uh, with with Paul, yeah. So with Yugi, you can hang out with that guy. Yeah, hang out I with think George too. Paul Mercurio did as well. Yeah, Mercurio. I'm pretty sure. Uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. I love those guys. Uh, right, John right. Fusel, uh, John Fusel sang, and Fugle, you Fugle sang. Fugle sang, and yeah. you. Uh, I listen. I like to listen to you two talk about politics and religion. It gets pretty heated between the two of you. You agree the same, but you're both on that level of intelligence. Like when you talk with Jimmy Dore. You guys have these very intelligent conversations. I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, I'm impressed to listen to you guys. You listening to stories about Hollywood or about entertainment, so it's not like you're a stranger to stories about politics. True. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. When you were uh, one of those singing, dancing waiter guys, you know, that sounds like so much fun. How old were you? Oh, you meant on the Bill Boggs show, the screw-up waiters. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Roger Sullivan and I were the two mess-up waiters in the 70s on uh, the Bill a... Boggs show in New York. And it was our first time going nuts. And we were, you know, trying to do improvisation and remember everything that um, Martin Harvey Friedberg had shown us and J.J. Barry had shown us about how to do improv. And uh, don't steal the scene, help the scene, and uh, don't stomp all over it, you know, and they things like that. must have been good times, right? It was so adrenal. I can't, there are very few times in your life when you get the, it's the first time feeling. We eventually, by repetition, we adjust to it. We acclimate to it. Right. We eventually yawn during it. Yeah. It's just our nature that everything that excited us will eventually become just another day. But not you, you little scene stealer. Do you think that some of your confidence came from having show business parents? I know your father was a jazz musician, right? right? And your mom was a singer. She was a, a singer in a four girl, two four girl groups. Like the lollipop kind of She did. Girl. She was in the cordettes. 
in the cordette. So when you, you would actually go and see your parents on stage. So from a young age, you knew that it was possible to be an entertainer. Yeah. So that is a huge, I think that's a big a step up break that they for a lot of kids. They didn't throw a judgment on me about it when I wanted to also entertain. My dad, in fact, was a huge fan of comedy. He got me into Jonathan Winters. Wow, that's he amazing. He would play the albums for me, and it started to link into my head, you know. Uh, by the time I really started to do it, he was gone. He died in 72. Wow. But, he was uh, a young man then. He was young, he's 52. And how did he pass? His uh, liver failed him. Wow. It, a liver failing like that, is that from is that from something or is that genetic? From jazz. From jazz. Like hard life living, is that what you're saying? Uh, it's the, you know, the quality of the drinks they serve you in an evening and when they're feeding them all night, shot glasses and stuff, you know. People buy you shots, they don't give you the good stuff. Yeah, that's so interesting. That's that's really too bad because 52, I'm going to be 52 in like a week. We know different things than we did then. They didn't know how to describe PTSD or any of that stuff. They just said, oh, you know, just have a martini and maybe go get yourself a smoke, find a dame and a steak. Did your dad have PTSD? Uh, yeah, a little bit, I think. From? World War II. He was in the war? Yeah. No kidding. How long was he in in the war? Three and a half years. No, but uh, some of it then at the end, he eventually was able to transition into uh, doing music in USO. And, mm-hmm. things like that. and then from there, he went on to get more musical background and things like that. It was probably a, a big impetus to, to you know, to Collect- study music to get out of that situation. Well, yeah, he was being himself, you know. Yeah. He, was, he found himself in Good the craziest him. of circumstances mm-hmm. where, you, you know, he could find yourself dead, but he found himself. Well, you know, I, I, I'm happy that my daughter sees me and her dad, uh, that we're both in the arts, and, and neither of us have a lot of money, but she sees that there's possibility. Whereas, like, I was growing up, it wasn't in the realm, you know, growing up in middle America outside of Pittsburgh, there was, it wasn't in the realm of possibility that, mm. that you could ever be on television or in the movies or even know people that, you know, that, that, that were on television or in the movies, we never even thought you could meet John Lennon, let alone have him as your neighbor. John Lennon was looking for people to like him. It would look up and hope that you would give a kind face, you know? Because yeah. he, he was exploring, like, the consciousness of love. And uh, you don't want to be walking around frowns the entire time when you're looking for it. I mean, there is a lesson in it, but that shouldn't be the only one. It seems uh, so... Uh, it just seems so crazy that people blamed him, you know, for breaking up the Beatles or, or, or blamed Yoko or I mean I, I understand well, maybe they were the only gossip to go but so it's long. Just, no, of course, of course, but just that he had to take all that so personally. That's really and not that he had to take it personally, but the people that people focused on him personally rather yeah. than as a band, it just phased out. Their time was over. You know, that yeah, was man, that. Yeah. Match and, is done. And look how they all went on to have other successful careers. So it's not like it was the end of these musicians. It was just the end of that one particular thing, like a television series or, you know, a length of time that you spend on any any sort of project. You know, there's a time for it, and then that time yeah. goes away. We move on, and you're on another show. Crowds get a little bit of Roman arena kind of thinking of, you know, this does not please me. You're not taking into account anybody in the arena, well, what it, they're going through. Right, and it's so frustrating as well because music, of course, can live on forever. You don't need to have that kind of a, a time res, you know constraint. And they, of course, do play John Lennon music and the Beatles music every flipping day. You, you can't go through a day without hearing a Beatles song. Am I right? Do you think that's true? In one reference or another, like seeing a sign or seeing something on a calendar or right. hearing some sort of Beatles reference, even if it's not a song. Right. It can't happen. Yeah, it's that birthday song shows up all the time. You say it's your birthday. That's the one. Birthday <laughs> Hey, listen, I always enjoy talking with you, Rick Overton. Are we done? We're we're gonna be done here in a second, yeah, man. I mean, this oh, is what happens. Flew by, just flew Listen, by. Listen, like 2000, 2018. What should we look for? I know, I know the show. Um, I'm dying up here on show. I'm dying up here. Is that's the one, man? 
It is so great. It really Everybody is. It is so good. You guys head over. If you don't have Showtime, just go over to YouTube and you can at least watch the first episode and you'll get hooked. Trust me. All right, you guys, I got to wrap it up right about now. I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. Let Rick know that you enjoyed his story and tweet him over there on Twitter at Rick Overton. And of course, you can follow me over there as well at StoryWorthy. And join us next week on StoryWorthy for Jefferson Graham from USA Today's Talking Tech, talking about his worst interview ever. And folks, it's bad. Don't miss Jefferson Graham next week on Storyworthy. All right, I want to thank everybody over at Wondery Media, including Hernan Lopez and everybody on the Wondery team. And don't forget to check out my sponsors on the show today, you guys, because when you check them out and you support them, then you're supporting me and everybody gets paid. All right, you guys, one more time on behalf of Rick Overton. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you, Christine. It was a lot of, so much fun getting caught up here. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to StoryWorthy on iTunes and visit the StoryWorthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Your favorite band's about to play a sold-out show, and you definitely got tickets. And drinks. Now hurry and make it back to your spot. Pass this person, and that person, about 20 more. Ooh, watch out for feet. Hey. Just keep going. A little further. Oh, there's your friend. Over here. Right where you want to be. Close enough to see the set list. And they're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Hi, it's Carl Deichler, CEO of Beachbody. And I'm giving away 10,000 free memberships a week to try our amazing Beachbody fitness and nutrition programs. Pick any program and just follow it step by step, like our 21-day fix program or the Ab Shredding Muscle Burns Fat program. Plus, there's free support in personalized fitness groups with our community of over 2 million members. Now is the time, so don't wait. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great.